what's up guys and welcome to episode 15 of Mr. Millennial's Revenge. I'm your host Nick DiMaria. Thanks for tuning in. So on today's episode, I am joined by uh, the drummer and visual artist, Michael LaRocca. And uh, yeah, great interview. Uh, we did it over uh, the holiday season and uh, finally got to talk to Mike and, and chat about some music. And um, it's it's been great because I, you know, I, I normally interact with Mike uh Mostly on Facebook, uh, only got to play with each other once at a jam session, but I've been a uh, fan of his uh, just from uh, the output, whether it's visual art, his paintings, or the music he's been uh, producing. It's it's been great to uh, finally have our our paths cross and and have a, a a sit down and a talk. So really excited for you guys to hear that, and that's coming up later. So check it out, stay tuned, all that good stuff. Uh, but yeah, before we uh, begin, let's get the housekeeping going. Uh, Mr. Millennial's Revenge is a production of the New Haven Jazz Underground, which is a grassroots community-based organization dedicated to presenting concerts, clinics, and jam sessions all in the name of jazz in the great city of New Haven, Connecticut. And we are completely crowdfunded. So as always in every episode, I say, please look in your wallet, look in your heart, look towards the future and uh hit that hit that p uh that i don't know subscribe it's not a subscribe button it's more like a commitment button <laughs> no 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 i'm kidding but sign up seriously go on patreon.com sign up for as low as two dollars a month and you can help us keep the virtual jazz lights on so we're not all vaccinated yet so we're still pre uh, presenting concerts only uh over the internet and um Funny enough, we are going to take a break for January. Um, we're not having a January um, Mind the Hang concert because, um, quite frankly, uh, uh, we wanted to give back into uh, um, um, to Alec. We're giving him a little vacation because he was producing the concerts uh, uh, at the Ellie Center of Contemporary Art, and, and I have so much uh, thanks to give to that organization for allowing us to use their facilities. But, you know... It's that time of year where uh, uh, in normal times, gigs, jams, they would be canceled on a dime because of snow and inclement weather and stuff. So just getting ahead of the curve, because you know what? If 2020 has taught me one thing, it's like, gotta always think ahead, right? So we're not going to do a Mind the Hang uh, in January, but we will be back. Um, it's looking like February 11th, I believe, is the next Mind the Hang concert. And we're tentatively scheduling the Brandon Terzakis trio. So hopefully, uh, hopefully that, you know, that stays uh, <laughs> stays concrete for the most part. Maybe it turns into a quartet or another uh, project of his. But hopefully Brandon uh, will we'll be able to present him and his band um in early February, probably the second week, which is when we normally do the Mind the Hang. But hey, man, we do the Mind the Hangs because of our patrons. So please, I'm not going to waste more time. You know the routine. Get on patreon.com slash NHVJU and sign up for as low as $2 a month and help us keep going in this time and hopefully beyond. So, um... I saw two movies over the holiday season that I want to share with you guys. Uh, first, I talked about this last episode, Ska, right? So if you know me uh, or if you don't, I'll give you the quick version. Uh, I came up uh, in Ska and punk bands in the, in the mighty uh, Connecticut Ska scene uh, um, of, the, of the late 90s and early 2000s. And uh, proud, very proud of being... Um, you know, uh, an active musician in such a strong and vibrant music scene at that time. I don't know what it's like these days because I, uh, I kind of, you know, left it all behind for the most part when I, when I left my band. But, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I wanted to be in a band and I kind of refused to listen to Chicago because my parents kept telling me I should. So I immediately thought it must be bullshit, right? 
And uh, I kind of let them show me tower power, you know? We're talking like 11, 12, 13, 14 years old here. So relax, okay? Uh, anyone who's like, oh my god, I was so into back to Oakland when I was... 12 years old. Oh, give me a fucking break. I'm so sorry that you were so much more hip than me at that age. I was too busy reading Star Wars comic books and watching Predator all the time. So, hey, back off. But I digress. Um, yeah, I got into Tower Power. That They were pretty cool. And I was like, yeah, th this this sounds like my school jazz band with, with like, you know, <laughs> with guitars. Um but later on, I was I was so desperate to be in a band. I, I really wanted to be in a band badly. And in middle school, like so many horn players, I discovered ska music, and uh, and and that started the that really started my career, man. Like you know, um, I you know I got into like local garage bands and stuff, and would play the occasional gig. And then in two thousand one, I joined the band the the Flaming Tsunamis, and. Uh, was with that band for five years, you know, touring, recording, playing show after show after show. And it really was uh, a great time in my life that I look back on fondly. But we were part of uh, a, a larger scene, a larger wave of music. And uh, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because uh, on Amazon Prime, there's a new uh, documentary called Pick It Up. And it's uh, it's about the ska... Um, you know, the ska wave of the uh, mid to late 90s. And it was, I mean, I <laughs> I posted on Facebook, I, I posted a link to the trailer, tagged a couple of people I knew I'd like it. And I was just like, the feels are on standby. And it couldn't have been more accurate. I, like, it was emotional, man. Like, you know, they, they interviewed so many, so many people. And... Just hearing the story of Third Wave, you know, through basically my first musical heroes, you know, before Eddie Henderson, Miles Davis, Donald Byrd, Jeremy Pelt, Dave Douglas, you know, uh, Dwayne Eubanks, like na I'm naming names, right? Before Kenny Dorn, before all these people, you know, that are important to me now, it was it was the guys in Real Big Fish, Less Than Jake, Spring Hill Jack, um, uh, uh, the Boss Tones, Pilfers. Uh, uh, Five Iron Frenzy, Dance Hall Crashers. I mean, it was insane. They interviewed so many people for this documentary, and it was really, it was really cool because there were so many times. I remember being in like music history and trying to bring up like, you know, how ska like <laughs> was important uh, in in so many facets, especially with like um, integration, like you know, especially in the two tone era, you know. Um, just the, the the way you had bands of, of mixed um, you know mixed backgrounds working uh, working together you know it, it, it's something to be said but anyway the, this this documentary was incredible in the sense that it was very very thorough and it and like I said it interviewed everybody and it just brought back a lot of good memories um, a lot of great tunes um, and it just you know it, it, it made me realize that like you know there's some accomplishments that maybe like, you know, don't seem that great to, you know, uh, some people are mega important to me, you know, like, like I, I got to work with Spring Hill Jack, which was my favorite band, uh, from like eighth grade through high school. And, uh, I, I got to record their, um, their late, their 2017 release, which was really fucking cool. And, um, you know, I've got I've gotten to work with uh, uh, Chris Rhodes from the Mighty Mighty Boston's and um, Vinnie Noble from Pil the Pilfers, and and it's just like you know you're in the studio with these guys and you get starstruck and <laughs> you know they're only like 15 20 years older than me sometimes, so it's like they're you know I'm like oh can I have a picture with you please, and you know and they smile and laugh and of course they do it but it's like you don't understand when I was like in eighth grade you were on you weren't. Like I had a poster of you on the wall, man. Like, like, like I had maybe two or three Spring Hill Jack posters in my bedroom wall growing up. And it's like to work with that band. It's like, you know, I I can't tell you how many times it's like, uh, it, it, it you know, it felt like I made it in a sense. You know, it sucks that it, things didn't work out the way they did, and I haven't worked with them since uh, the CD release. But you know, you never know. Uh, they got my number. Um, but uh. Uh, it, it was just really hip it, it, to see like such a thorough, um, you know, like I was saying, such a thorough documentary. And it gave a lot of legitimacy to um, 
to the movement, you know, and it, it gave the history because, you know, a lot of people don't realize that ska came before reggae. Reggae is, you know, owes everything to ska music. And, um, oh, and two more things before I forget, because uh, I know I'm kind of rambling, but that's how the monologue goes. Uh, they interviewed uh, uh, Vic Ruggiero and Agent J from the Slackers. And uh, my first professional gig out of college, my first real, like, no one... Uh, no friends of mine are hiring me. This was a real gig I got recommended for. It was in the Dave Hilliard and the Rocksteady 7 band. Uh, Dave Hilliard is the saxophonist of the Slackers. And I got to work with them for a few months. And that was incredible, man. I was I was subbing for the regular trumpet player. And again, playing you know, with someone who I highly, um, you know, thought, think very highly of and got to play in their band and you know, professionally, it was, it was, it was incredible. I remember, you know, uh, the first gig I was scared shitless because, uh, you know, you just want to do your best and that sort of thing. So like, you know, before I was getting jazz gigs, I was still getting ska gigs and, you know, and and all, all the mileage matters, you know, like every gig matters. So it's like to work for Dave was, was awesome. And then, um, and then I, I like to share, uh, my, you know, my buddy, <laughs> my, my jazz older brother, Mr. Jeremy Pelt, we were, uh, we were hanging out, oh man, like a year and a half ago now. And he was telling me about how one of his first gigs when he got to the city was he played in the Scottalites. Now, if you don't know who the Scottalites are, they are one, they are like, oh man, what, what are they like? They're like the jazz messengers of ska, right? So you've, uh, you've got ska music, which is really just a blend, you know, the, the, the shortest version is it's a blend of American jazz with the Caribbean rhythms of Jamaica. So the Scottalites were almost like a jazz combo playing, you know, American jazz standards, but with that, you know, um, you know that uh, distinct sound that's uh, in rhythms that uh that they um uh, that that Scott's known for and you know and he tells me man like when you know or he told me when he got to the city he wanted to take all the work he can get he got a gig touring with the Scottalites and it was funny man because like to him he was telling me like it was just a gig right it was it was just a gig and he got to work with you know uh Roland Alfonso and and, and cats like that and you know, and he's saying like, you know, uh, they they would ride me to, I forget what was what he said, like, don't lose the form, or I gotta go back and ask him. It was like, it, and it wasn't the form; it was like the distinct ska rhythm, like make sure you nail it, and how they were always very, the you know, the old timers of the band were always very very strict about making sure that you always play with that distinct feeling because. Again, I think ska gets written off as this silly, loud, stupid music you play when you're a teenager, but it really has a strong history and high standards by the musicians who play it, you know? And, um, you know, he's telling me about the, you know, the, these gigs he would play and all this stuff. Something about, ah, oh God, it's going to kill me. I got I to gotta text him about it. But, um, you know, he's telling me about these gigs and I'm just like star-eyed. <laughs> you know, I'm like, you got to play with the Scottalites? My goodness. You know, and, and it means something because they are in, in their field. They are a incredibly established band and they set the standard for so many other ska bands. And, you know, the New York Ska Jazz Ensemble or the Rotterdam Jazz Foundation and plenty of other bands similar, the Alstonians, you know, up in Boston, like, these bands base their whole sound, uh, the Toasters, you know, out of New York City. These bands base their whole sounds off the Scottalites. So, like, just much respect, you know. And it's just so funny that, uh, you know, uh, someone I hold so near and dear, Jeremy, uh, got to play with them. It's like, you know, it's so I'm so jealous. <laughs> there's still time because they're still around. So ho- hopefully after all this pandemic nonsense, maybe I'll get the call. Who knows? But let's just say... If they're listening, I am available. <laughs> no, but seriously, check it out. It was like a $4 rental. I don't want to like, you know, I'm not, I, I can't condense the history of Ska in, in a single monologue. You know what I mean? So it's like, you got to check it out. Just check out, it's called Picking It Up, the Ska, Third Wave Ska of the 90s or something like that. Um, cr- incredible film. And uh, if you grew up in that scene like I did, you know, get ready, man. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fast drive down nostalgia way. And I hope you, uh, you know, whether you lived it or not, I hope you really enjoy it because it, it it was just like so delightful 
to watch that movie. So check it out. And of course, uh, the other movie I saw over Christmas break was Soul by Pixar. And uh, man, you know, w- probably Pixar's best movie, I think. Uh, equivalent to Up, an emotional uh, reaction. Let's just say that. Um, you know, I was a little put off um, at first. Oh, let me start. Total spo- spoiler, spoiler alert. Okay, so if you haven't seen it, you don't want me to ruin it. Fast forward, uh, um, bec- you know, to the interview because I'm gonna uh, talk about it. But okay, spoiler alert! Spoiler alert! Why can't I say that? Weird. Anyway, I'm gonna talk about the movie Soul. So get ready. Okay, get ready. Okay. So um, I got a I got this vibe that at the beginning of the movie it was gonna have like you know teaching is not cool, <laughs> you know, vibe. Because clearly I relate to the character, uh, Joe, I believe his name is, because, you know, by day I teach music to kids. Uh, I'm a general music teacher, and by night I try to make it as a jazz musician. And I was really appreciative of how it, you know, the movie changed in the direction that, like, no teaching is important because really at the at the end the whole thing's about being a teacher you know and and how he helps 22 along her way and it was definitely you know the most personal personal uh pixar movie but i'm glad to see that so many people are reacting so positively to it because i feel like i am constantly banging the drum of be a teacher you know if 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 you can handle it and you like it um teach music you know uh, it's a great, it's a great way to support yourself and, uh, and, and live, you know, comfortably in a sense, you know, I'm not money driven, but it is nice to have a steady income and, and not have to worry about some things, um, so that I could pursue my music. And, you know, even before the pandemic, gigs never really got back to where they were before the recession in a lot of ways. And it was nice to, um, be able to pay my pay my side men what I thought they could deserve and not feel like I wasn't going to eat for that week. Um, I I loved that freedom. I really did. And I know there's people who are not going to agree with me, but I don't give a fuck. <laughs> so quite quite frankly, um, I I liked that I was able to pay uh, my guys, you know, or gals and. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and worry about myself last. And that was great. And I think, I think that helps, you know, I think being a good band leader is when you do that, you know, when you think about your side men and how you take care of your side men reflects on how the, you know, you run your band and, you know, uh, Andrew Zwart, my bassist, Andrew Kasiba, my keyboardist, pianist, they've been with me for over a decade. So I like to think that I'm doing something right. <laughs> but anyway, um, I always tell younger guys, uh, younger musicians, you know, check out, check out that education front, you know, uh, consider being a teacher because you know what, first off, it's a fun gig. It's fun to teach music and to teach it to kids. And I feel like teaching, you know, uh, music to a bunch of third graders, it balances out the, the seriousness of being a musician, you know, like you know, by day I'm playing the piano and I'm playing one, four, five and singing some kind of folk song. And then at night I'm trying to, you know, play my best on uh, a standard or a bebop tune or something like that. And one definitely helps the other. Keeps things in perspective. What I always love is the music I, I, I do with the kids is, um, you know, obviously it's simpler and it always reminds me of how music is supposed to make you feel. You know, music doesn't always have to be super fucking complex. And sometimes the greatest songs are, 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 you know, quote unquote, not so serious. You know, they're a little like simple, so to speak. But like that shit keeps you grounded, man. And it makes you a better musician if you could remember uh, what, turned you on to music when you were younger and it was a more visceral reaction so you know i i that's how i feel about it and you know in the way that like um 
you know, what am I trying to say here? Like it, yeah, it balances me. It makes me happy. It gives me purpose and, you know, helps me stay focused for sure because I don't have as much time to practice and compose and stuff. So it definitely helps you keep your priorities straight, but man, you know, without cats, uh, jumping in that classroom, man, the next like innovators will never come to be because every one of them had a teacher. You know, and that's something Soul uh, taught is, you know, you especially saw in the drummer. I forget his name. I believe he was played by Questlove. You know, he was saying like, oh, um, you know, your class was my favorite as a kid. And it's totally true, man. You know, all, all the all the, all our heroes, they had teachers and we need more talented, passionate musicians teaching music so that the kids get pumped up about music. They learn about music in a fun way, an exciting way. You know, and uh, I feel like Soul definitely got that message across. So, you know, if you've got Disney Plus or whatever, you know, rent it, stream it, do we got to do. Incredible movie. And uh, I'm looking forward to a good cry again when I when I watch it another time. So check it out. Uh, you know, uh, I know this was the monologue today was about uh, movies, but it's fine. So Soul and pick it up. Check them out. They were so great. So I always like to uh, bring up a record that uh, that I'm into, and I talked about going to the record shop in the last episode. And um, yeah, I picked up on a whim. Mort Garson, Patch Chord Production, music from Patch Chord Productions. Total random purchase. I was so happy that I got it because uh, Mort Garson is. I found out later. I bought. I found out after I bought this record. He uh, he was like a contemporary of like Raymond Scott. And if you don't know who Raymond Scott is, you definitely know his music if you watched any kind of Looney Tunes cartoon because uh, you know that song? Uh, you, know, you know what I mean? Like, uh, <laughs> um, It's called Sledgehammer, I think. And, uh, Raymond Scott wrote it, and it's been used in, in cartoons and, and whatnot. But uh, Mort Garson is very similar, but uh, this particular album, uh, he it was it's all music he wrote from uh, Moog synthesizer and it's from the 70s. He had a record called Plantasia, which I guess is kind of famous. Um, I'm not too fam familiar with it, but I was definitely checking it out um, uh, after I've gone through this record. But uh, yeah, there's some great fucking shit on this. Um, it's all done on the Moog. Tracks include music for advertising, number one, number two, and number three, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, number four and number five. Um, and then you get stuff from like, uh, you know, the blobs, son of blob theme. And, um, there was another one, uh, Rhapsody in green, you know, and stuff from, uh, I think, I believe there was one track from that record, um, Plantasia. I got to check it out again, but super cool record. If you could check, it is, it is streaming. So if you want to check it out, look it up, but Mort, G sorry, Mort Garson, music from patch chord productions super cool record very interesting uh pink record by the way i was very excited to see a pink see-through vinyl record i don't get too many of those so that was uh, that was exciting so you know like i said i like to look up i like to just buy random stuff when i got the loot and uh from the weirdo section over at red scroll records that's what i picked up i was very pleased All right, now on to the interview section of the episode. Um, like I said up before, uh, Michael LaRocca, he is a drummer. He's a visual artist. He's a painter. Uh, definitely someone I admire and look forward to hopefully working with in the future. Uh, I went to the new school and, uh, you know, worked with guys like uh, Adam Cyril and Nate Woolley. And, uh, yeah, we talk about avant-garde jazz and some of this, uh, jam, uh, jazz, blah, 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 some of the music series that he ran. One was at Willimantic Records. And, um, yeah, it was great to ch uh, catch up with him, talk with him, see what he's up to during the pandemic. And uh, he's got um, two recordings coming out. So we talk about those in the interview as well. So let's check it out. My interview with drummer Michael LaRocca. <laughs> And joining me now on the podcast is drummer and artist Mike LaRocca. How you doing, man? Good. How are you? Good. I said Mike instead of Michael. Is that bad? 
No, it's totally okay. Okay. I, I... I use Michael, but I've had people call me Mike, Mikey, whatever. Okay. I, I, I have friends who call me LaRocca or LaRoque for short, you know. Oh, okay. I got, right. I got a lot of different names. I uh, I have a tendency for getting too uh, too friendly too quickly, so I, I I don't want to offend or anything. So, but oh uh, no, it's okay. <laughs> but you uh, think I'm evil? <laughs> no, no, you, don't, you, don't you know, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's yeah. it, you know, it's like um, I got a uh, uh, you know, I'm trying to set a, a pro, you know, this is meant to be fun, but I'm still trying to set like a professional bar, and sometimes no, I have to I remind you. myself that uh, I'm I'm tr you know. Uh, professional yes. courtesy has to be established before, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, you know, totally before cool. people totally start going, cool. oh, that that idiot. So, uh, no, th yeah, thanks no, for joining. No, no. Thanks for joining <laughs> me on the show, man. I was looking forward to uh, having a chance to talk to you because um, uh, you're 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 a, you're a Connecticut guy. You're a drummer and uh, and and a visual artist as well, which is which is super cool. I want I want to get to like both at some point in the conversation, but uh, oh. uh, happy to have you here. And uh, thanks for bearing with me because the holiday season has been crazy, um, despite the fact we're all locked uh, locked away at home and, and whatnot. I still find myself uh, unable to uh, keep my head on my shoulders sometimes. So it's nice that some things don't haven't changed. Mm. Yeah, there's no worries. Uh, yeah. I'm happy to be here. Oh, great. Uh, OK, so. Um, you know what? My, all right. So uh, full candid, man, I, you, you just kind of like got on my radar. We've only played together like once, like at that jam, at the jam session. So, yeah. um, <laughs> yeah. you know, oh, this, man. Yeah. yeah, no, it's cool. And uh, that's like the weirdest situation for me. Cause I, I'm not usually playing straight ahead stuff. You know, I went cause my friend, uh, Paul, he was going and he's like, yeah, man, you should come to this jam and just like sit in. So it's like, all right, whatever, I'll come. And it was, it was actually a, a blast. It was super fun. Oh yeah. I remember that night. And I was like, surprised you were that you were like hey man and i was like oh hey you know like uh like it's you um so yeah so i i think you might be um you might be the first musician guest that i have not worked with so far <laughs> so yeah well i mean we're i think this is uh we're only like 15 episodes in so you know oh, to wow, get 15. to get yeah to get the podcast chops going i i made sure to throw some meatballs and some lobs so i've had like uh, yeah, colleagues yeah, yeah. colleagues of mine on the show for for the most part so you might be the very first like uh uh not like i've never gigged with uh guest uh almost officially because I, I had joe morris on so he's he's kind of the first but i've i've worked with him a little bit more than you so mm -hmm. so i guess that's your title is you're you're actually the first real guest <laughs> on this show oh wow well wow, it's an honor and a pleasure <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, yeah no no problem so uh mike you, you you're from you are from connecticut right but you went to school you went to uh, new school or manhattan i went to the new school yeah, yeah. i'm from connecticut Where, whereabouts in connecticut I'm I'm in trouble. Oh, okay, cool. I used to uh, teach at Creative Music in Monroe for like 15 oh, years. Oh my god! Uh, yeah. I remember I would do like little rock bands there when I was I was younger. We oh, covered Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. Sure. We oh, Hard Day Night, Hard Days Night by the Beatles. Yeah. Who Who taught you? Do you Grant remember? Grant Austin Driver. Grant. Was, yeah. Yeah. You know. You remember? Oh man, that's so crazy. I haven't seen him in like actually just years i wonder what he's up to man well, i haven't well, seen him in so long you know yeah well here's the thing man um i i mean i knew grant forever because uh we used to teach across the hall from each other and you know we were always like friendly to each other and uh he like he like took uh he like left creative to start his own thing and i think it's kind of like a Mad Men season three thing he like left and took his students with him so there was like this, he will not be named vibe for a while there. Oh, so wow. I, yeah. So actually I haven't talked to him since he left. So I don't know what he's up to these days. He's, I think yeah. he's kind of still based in the area, but I'm not I sure. Remember him and Tucker calendar. That Tucker. was the other guy. He was the violin guy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think his name was Tucker calendar. I barely remember Tucker. See, for a while, a lot of the strings teachers were Yaleys and they and they had this this <laughs> this vibe. Well, we'll just leave it at that. They had this vibe. Yaleys. And I was like, hey, I go to music school, too. You know, you know, like it, yeah. it was. Oh, you know, really? yeah. 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 It was definitely. Who cares, uh, it, man, we're all going to be working minimum wage jobs. I, no, yeah, I'm true, <laughs> yeah, true. No, I mean, there's we can't all be conductors. Um, but uh, yeah, I man. Um, 
it, it's so weird because I have work like 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 my the basis in my band was a student of uh, the bass teacher at Creative when he was a kid. So it's it's so weird. He was like literally in the room next to me for years before I even met him because he's he's a few years younger than me. Mm. And, How old are you? I'm 37. OK, OK. That makes so, a lot of sense that I, I would be that young and then be around the same people. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's I, crazy. That's yeah. crazy how small of a world it is. You know, it, it really is, man. And I had a feeling that like you would have some sort of re relationship with uh, with creative being from Trumbull. I, I just I just had a feeling by chance was Riggs Marion ever in those camps with you? Do you remember that kid? Uh, I feel like he was on because no. you guys your rock band posters used to be on the hallway. And Riggs I know, Mary? and I know Riggs did the rock band sometimes. He was a, he was a piano player. No, I oh, don't okay. remember him. Oh, okay. He, he was, he was a student of mine. I, I taught him piano and he was, I, I was like, Riggs, huh? We're, you know, who, why'd your parents name you Riggs? And he, <laughs> he goes straight face. He goes, uh, I'm actually named after a character in a Mel Gibson movie. And I went, you're named after Martin Riggs on, in Lethal Weapon. He was like, oh, you've heard of it? And I was like, oh, my God. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. And Damn. he, man, Damn. he was your quintessential kid who was forced to take piano lessons. Oh, I mean, no. you know, and, and, oh. and we actually, we, we did not get on. I could tell he didn't like me for a long time. And he used to come in with this attitude. And I, and I just said to him once, I was like, hey, man, you know, if you don't want to take piano lessons, don't give me an attitude. Talk to your parents because I, I'm just, I got a job to do. And if you don't like it, like, I don't know what to tell you. And after that talk, he was like, cool with me, probably because I spent most of the lesson just bullshitting with him. But you know, <laughs> I, who knows where he is the, the, this these days? He might like be in college at this point, which is kind of crazy to think about. Maybe he's turned back around. Maybe he's a virtuoso pianist now. Man, that would be that would be mind blowing. But uh, That's the oh, story. Yeah. so so uh, Trumbull High School, I guess. Uh, 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 no, yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Oh, Not no, even. you know, it's cool. Yeah. It's all good. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, um, yeah. But uh, 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 let me you know, uh, are we talking usual story like like elementary band in fifth grade played the drums, you know, and then went to school? Like, how'd you how'd you get how'd you end up at the new school? Oh, man, it's so weird. It's so long and complicated. Uh, when I was in elementary school, I was doing like, uh, you know, percussion in the band, but I sure. would never go to the rehearsals. <laughs> okay. and then I, I would show up for the concerts and just kind of like play. Um, and then um, in middle school, I would do percussion because that's, you know, it just carried over. So like, all right, we're going to put you in percussion classes. I got a little bit more into it because then I was getting into like drums more. And then... Um, in high school i didn't do band i went to rca which is a um like a performing arts high school that takes oh. place after school four days a week and so Where's I, that? I went there that's in near uh bridgeport oh okay because new haven is something similar to that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and i know hartford does too if I'm yeah sure. yep yeah yeah, yeah. The, uh, what jackie mclean set up um the artist collective i think or jazz collective something like that sure um I know, I know, like all the all the Hartford cats are now going to come crucify me, but I never, I didn't grow up relate uh, connected to Hartford, so I can't remember the name. All I know is that it was started by Jackie McLean. Mm. Yeah, so so yeah, that's cool. I didn't know that. Relation but... to yeah. yeah to the um the Hart School of Music, sure. right? Doesn't he? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, but yeah, like, did you? I mean, I mean, new school. Where did where did you get? Cause, you know, for anyone who doesn't know. Mike, your music is like you're the you're the uh, the new Sonny Murray on my radar. You're the you're oh, the new, you know you're the well, mill. Um... Am I allowed to swear? On the <laughs> of course you are. Oh, okay. Uh, right, fuck so cool. shit, cock oh. balls. You know. <laughs> yeah, no. That's like uh, the nicest thing anyone can say to me. Wow, that's thank you. <laughs> oh no, I I mean I'm not trying to blow smoke up your ass. Like like I I, I don't know how you got on my radar. Probably through Joe Morris or something. And, you know, or just the wonders of Facebook. And um, and I was like, oh, here's a kid who like unapologetically plays like free and experimentally and, and, and mm. you know, and all in, you know, 
I, I've heard you play straight ahead. So it's like, I know you've heard Jimmy Cobb before, but it's like, mm. there's not a lot of drummers who study Jimmy Cobb who can say they've listened to Sonny Murray or Milford Graves or something like that. So it's like, yeah. how did you coming from jazz? Yeah. 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 Like how'd you get to the, you know, so how'd you get to the new school? Like what, where, where did you discover these cats, man? So performing arts high school. So when high school happens, that's when I get into jazz freshman year, you know, I I'm listening. I, I download a copy of kind of blue on my, my eye, whatever. And I'm listening to it, you know, and then yeah. I'm getting into other drummers. I'm listening to other jazz records, you know, I'm listening to like all like the 1959 records that are really great. Like time out by the Dave Brubeck quartet. So I'm sure. getting to Joe Morello, Mingus, um, so I'm getting into Danny Richmond and, yep. you know, not just the drummers, but also just the music in general. And then, so then there's the shape of jazz to come. And so that kind of was like, I heard that and I was like, oh, wow, this is different. You know, I want yeah. more stuff like this. And simultaneously, I was also getting into just like experimental rock music and even some noise music and stuff oh, like cool. that and some early electronic music, music concrete type stuff, you know. So I was getting into all this stuff and simultaneously, I was also getting deeper into the avant-garde and free jazz world, improvised music world. So in high school, I was kind of that weirdo by like junior year. I'd be like, oh man, have you heard Unit Structures by Cecil Taylor? And they'd, I'd show my friends and they'd be like, dude, what the fuck are you listening to? You know? And I'm like, yeah. oh, <laughs> Spiritual Unity by Albert Eiler. All this yeah. stuff's so great. And it's like, oh, there's Michael. He's that, he's that weirdo who's into all that stuff, you know? So I kept just getting deeper into it. And then eventually, you know, by the end of high school, I was like, I want to go to New York City to find like-minded people who are into, you know, the music and kind of connect with them so that's that's, that's how yeah. that happened that's awesome man um yeah like it kind of the same thing happened with, with me i i was i was definitely more aware of of the fringe uh you know musicians and i think it's because my senior year of high school uh my my teacher got to like teach a um jazz history course like in school which was like the perfect elective for, uh, for, you know, for me. And, um, there was like, it was like a pre written curriculum book, you know? And so it touched mm -hmm. on free jazz and stuff. So I was like, Oh, Ornette Coleman, Don Cherry, um, you know, Cecil Taylor and stuff. I didn't take it like seriously. I, I, I certainly wasn't into it, but I was like, I was definitely aware that these people existed before, definitely some of my colleagues when I got to college, you know? And so, but, but, but for me, it was like, I love the trumpet. So I want to listen to every trumpet player there is. So, you know, I, you know, it went from miles to Freddie Hubbard, you know, Lee Morgan, Kenny Dorn, but then it's like Woody Shaw, Don Cherry, Lester Bowie, you know, mm, yeah. um, you know, and so on and so forth. And so just through my audiophile obsession, I was just collecting records and tracks of like musicians that, you know, like Bobby Bradford and stuff like this. And, and, and then from those guys, I was paying, you know, you, you know, you can't listen to Don Cherry without being exposed to Albert Eiler or, or, or Nat, or, you know what I mean? Or Dewey Redman or so, or Ed Blackwell and stuff. And that reminds me, Shape of Jazz to Come, is that, is that Billy Higgins or is that Ed Blackwell? I can't remember. That's Billy, if I'm correct. Yeah. Let me yeah. actually look that up. Yeah, I'm pretty positive. Uh, yeah, now, I, I'm, I'm going to be wrong. I'm going to get blasted. I no, hope it's, I was it's, talking about the other drummers earlier. I hope I didn't mess any up. It's oh, no. It, Timeout is Joe Morello. Yeah, it is. Joe Morello. Um, Danny, Danny Richmond. Yep. Right, yep. Yeah, okay. That's what I'm oh, sure, dude, yeah. don't, don't worry about me because I'm constantly <laughs> I'm constantly looking up shit on my phone while, oh, I'm, while I'm talking about this stuff because, you know, you, you bring somebody up and you're like, oh, wait, was that Billy Higgins or Ed Blackwell? And like, you know, if, if you can't remember yeah, one Billy. of the – yeah, if, if, if you can't remember one of, you know, or you mix up one of the two major working jazz forces with a certain musician, you know, like, like, yeah. fuck off. Like, like, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry, because there was a good chance it was Billy Higgins and not Ed Blackwell. Or yeah, because the thing is, Billy and Ed both worked with him around the time. Right. So it's exactly. totally understandable exactly. to mix the two up. You know? Exactly. So it's it's quite all right. That's awesome, man, that you that you checked out that record. It, it kind of, you know more experimental music came to me organically again through the trumpet perspective because i i studied with eddie henderson so i got into mm. like herbie's you know 
uh, sextet stuff where his like really, uh, you know, his pre headhunter stuff. And it was like through that vessel, you know? So, yeah. but who, I mean, like when you got to new school, man, who are, who are you, who are you studying with? Because I feel like the new school is going to be much more open to non bebop centered music than like, oh, yeah. you know, say where I was. I mean, that's why I went there. Cause I knew that that would be one of the only schools other than like NEC where, yeah, you know, where I could really, or maybe even Wesleyan as well. I mean, yeah, okay, I take it back. There's a, there's a couple good schools around, around here that are really good for, you know, new music and sure. the music and free jazz and whatever you want to. And so, you know, I went there and I knew that, I knew that Andrew Surreal was there oh, and yeah. that was one yeah. of the things. Cause you know, I was a big fan of unit structures and conquistador. I love you know. Conquistador. Oh yeah. Incredible yeah. record with yeah, Bill yeah. Dixon on trumpet. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Jimmy good. Lyons yeah. too. Yeah. Oh yeah. Of course. And um, yeah, Jimmy's the man. And um, so I knew I was like, okay, well, Reggie Workman teaches here. Andrew Surreal teaches here. Um, you know, this is, this is like where I got to go. And so I sure. went there and I was lucky and fortunate enough to get to know Surreal and like get to work with him in school and like get to hang out and kind of talk with him and get to know him as a musician. Um, I remember the first time I met him, he was sitting in an ensemble room and I was like just a freshman, like I'd been there for a very short time and I saw him in the door and I was like, oh, this is it. I got to introduce myself. So I go up to him. I'm like, uh, uh, Mr. Cyril, I'm a, yeah, I'm a yeah. big fan of your drumming. And like, I just want to say you're like a really big inspiration. I, I hope to take lessons with you or work with you on ensemble. And he just looks at me and goes, well, uh, great. Makes me want to <laughs> go and practice. And I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah. And so I was like, man, that's deep. So I knew I had to, you know, work with him a little bit. And um, I did get to. And it was a really great time super warm inviting person really really funny guy too he's um very down to earth so it was great That's working awesome. with him but in terms of drummers um i took lessons with drummers but um i mainly took lessons with um the two people i took lessons with i took a year's worth of lessons with nate woolley and then i took a year's no way. worth yeah and so the thing was i, I took a nate. year's worth of lessons with nate and then a year with joe and i have to say that they're joe morris you mean yeah of course yeah. yeah and um uh you know those were like some of the greatest lessons cuz we would just play you know we would just play both with nate and joe and i'd ask them questions about their process and i find personally if you want to learn how to play improvised music yeah, it's great to take lessons with somebody who plays your instrument, but it's also fantastic to just play with other instrumentalists and kind of learn how they do it, you know, what their sure. thought process is on it and how they interpret the music in a pedagogical, dude, that's how you pronounce it, sense. Pedagogical or something. Pedagogical. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it sounded like that. I'll get yeah, blasted whatever. for that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's but, all good, um, man. Yeah. But I studied with drummers, um, mainly Amir Ziv. He's um, like the main drum guy at the new school. Okay. He's like super intense, like polyrhythmic exercises sort of stuff, you know. So yeah. I had a, a lot of classes with him as well as I took lessons with him first. And then after him, I took some lessons with Susie Ibarra. Um, I took lessons with Andrew Cyril, Chris Corsano, Mary Halverson. Oh, I'll cool. Go. Like, oh god, I don't want to forget anybody. Um because <laughs> there's so many people. I'm trying to like oh man, I'm having a brain fart. I feel like there's more people, but I'm just not all right. Well they'll blast me. They'll blast me. Well, you know, if it, it, you know, <laughs> even if we're at the end of the interview and in that that's when it pops, pops up. Head, I'll scream just, it at the top yeah, of my yeah, lungs. Just, yeah. Shout outs are okay, man. That's <laughs> that's fine. Um I'm really pleased to hear about Nate. I so I've been a fan of Nate Woolies for the longest time. And uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, I decided, you know, I'm going to take this out, you know, when it became very evident that nobody was working, right? Mm -hmm. And you would see musicians advertising like, hey, like I'm available for lessons because I'm not doing anything else. Mm -hmm. I, I said to myself, I was like, this is my opportunity to study with cats I've always wanted to study with. And I called up Nate and I, I, I got Nate's number either through Joe or Taylor Holbynum. Mm. And, uh, cause I, I've, I've studied with Taylor a few times 
and, and and Joe. So it's one of the one of the two. And I just called him up, man. And I was just like, hey, like I live down the street from Taylor. Like I've been a huge fan of yours. Can we do a Zoom lesson? And it was really great um, to just kind of, you know, just pick his brain for a little bit. Uh, I wish I could play with him, you know, in the lesson, but uh, he definitely gave me uh, a lot to think about because, you know, I feel like, you know, every in terms of trumpet, a lot of people know who Peter Evans is, you know, and, yeah. and, and, and if you don't, anyone listening, Peter is one of those people that the trumpet is truly an extension of his body. Like I've never seen someone play the horn without any barrier whatsoever like it, it and it's not it, it, it's a chops thing but it's also like he's just like he takes to it like you know uh, uh, what's the expression fish and water duck and water yeah. something like that and but the thing is is like so, so like a lot of people like like focus on him and i feel like nate uh, approaches uh you know improvised tr music to the trumpet in a w completely different way which always just really inspired me and in, in you know, interest me. So, so happy to like be able to talk to him for, for a little bit. Mm. Um, so that's really cool that you got to study with him. Cause I have no doubt that it, he, he taught you a lot of great stuff. He's so creative, man. Like he's, and he's like oh, such yeah. a chill guy, you know, you're just like, ah, thank you for being nice. <laughs> oh yeah. He's like uh he's like a saint, you know, yeah. he really is. It's it, yeah. It, him and Joe Morris are like definitely uh, and, and Taylor too. I don't know if you've ever studied with Taylor, but like same kind of personality where it's like very welcoming. It's funny, man. Like, uh, you know, I feel like hardcore beboppers are, you know, how, you know, they can get a reputation for being like super vibey and, you know, and kind of militant about what yeah. they think the music should be. <laughs> but yeah. that's also been my experience with some avant-garde musicians. And I'm just like, Oh, come on. Not you too. You know, like you guys yeah. are supposed to be accepting of everything, yeah, yeah. you know? So, uh, it's, it's really nice to like interact with, with creative musicians that are, you know, really approachable. No, and, totally. And that's awesome about, uh, Cyril, you know, and real quick too, again, it's, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's based on the instrument, you know, I I'm a huge Dave Douglas fan. And if, if you're unfamiliar with Dave, yeah, Douglas, he was up new you know, school. Yeah. yeah, he he, you know, he came up like in the 90s loft scene. So he's contemporaries with like, you know, David Binney and Yuri Kane and Joey Barron and, and, and you know, the Zorn uh, collect, you know, collective of musicians, mm. too. So like yeah. through, uh, you know, through Dave is how like I got into Braxton, actually, because you know braxton's got like a million records but you don't you know if you don't know where to start <laughs> yeah, if you don't know where to start you might pick something and you're like oh fuck it might not be for me uh so you know i uh dave was on a record with braxton and braxton's playing piano and pavone's oh, wow. on bass. yeah pavone's on bass and i think surreal's on drums and they play standards mm. and that record just blew me away you know i, I was love like braxton playing yeah. standards and yeah. exactly. And so what I did was I, I, I went, I, I approached Braxton's music through all of his standards records, you know, and, 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 and that's, that's how I got, yeah. And that's like how I got into, uh, you know, him a little bit more. Cause it was like, mm. it was easier to hear what he was doing over a tune I knew than to go into like, you know, some of his other stuff. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, surreal, um, and then, and then, like I, I love Hannibal Peterson, a uh, great trumpet player. He he worked with Cyril a bunch of times. So it's like, you know, it's like the connections and 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 whatnot mm. through the instrument. But yeah, man, like I, um, you know, it just it just led to a love of of uh, uh, you know, free playing musicians and stuff like that. But you know, I think about uh, um, what's that Sonny Murray record? Um, I think it's self titled. The one on ESP disc. Yeah, it's like just a picture of his face. But uh one, is arthur jones on it I on alto remember. sax I can't. I, i'm yes. forgetting the first i think now. it's i think it's like a quintet Jack was sales on trumpet i think yeah maybe it's yes i think so um it's uh yeah i, I hear you typing i'm doing the same yeah it's uh it's <laughs> like a quintet too. it's like a quintet record but there yeah. are yeah no 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 like yeah no... joica's corsell byrd lancaster alan silva oh jack graham on alto okay okay uh, okay Where's no, but yeah, yeah, it's it's the one where it's just the picture of him, right? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. No, yes. yeah, that's a it's classic. Yeah. yeah, so good, man. And it's like ah, oh, I just 
want to play you know <laughs> I'm, I'm i'm like thinking about all these records and i'm like oh man it's been forever since uh i've played anything you know this uh out you know mm. i say that with respect um but yeah like you know taking that lesson with Nate and, and you know and having the the time during the uh uh the pandemic i'm like now you know i'm like no more bullshitting around now i'm gonna start pursuing all these like you know, improvised music projects. I've been, I've, I've shelved for the last like 10 years. I'm going to like start fucking doing them, you know, but, and I think that's why it, what excites me about seeing your stuff being posted is because it's like, yeah, it's like, it's exciting to hear it, but it's like, I need to like, keep this going. I need, I need to, um, I need to, I need, I need to pursue this more. And, uh, you've got two albums. You, you've got one out and one coming out, right? Yep. Yeah, one just came out. Um, it's a live recording of a trio I'm in uh, playing in Arcata, California. And uh, then the other one is my official solo debut as a drummer. So that's going to be really, really exciting. I what was the. It's received yeah. positively. What, it's called Just a Drummer by Mike yep. LaRocca. Michael LaRocca. And uh, what was. Um... What was the, was there a creative goal or was there, was there, um, what was, what was the process behind this record? Because I, I, you sent me the link and there was, I guess, if I'm not mistaken, there were two tracks available mm, for, cause right it's now. not, it doesn't come out for another few weeks, right? Yeah. yeah it comes like, out on the uh, 16th. Yeah. So I heard, um, oh, oh, I heard clock two. That's the one. Mm. Yeah. That one reminded me of, uh, are you a book reader? <laughs> oh no, no, I'm not. Unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> okay. If you ever, if you ever, if, 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 you know, if I could recommend a book to you, there's a trilogy of books called, and it's relevant to this track. Uh, there's, there's a, a, a trilogy of books. I'm, I'm trying to bring them up now by Ian Tregillis and it's called the alchemy wars. And, and just the quickest snippet is it takes place in a world where in the 1600s, a Holland alchemist, a Dutch alchemist, discovered how to uh, create life, basically, uh, artificial life, okay? And because it's the 1600s, it's like steampunk. So he creates what are called what's called a clacker, and it's basically an android, but it's a Middle Ages version, so it's made out of brass, and, and it's, it's basically a living clock, right? So he creates these clackers, and Holland takes over the world, right? Um, France has to exile itself. France, like, is the last country to hold out. Flees to Canada. The Vatican follows them to Canada. The book, the book takes place in uh, like the 1920s. Uh, Holland control the Dutch Empire controls most of the world. France is basically Canada, um, and their mortal enemies and stuff. And uh, a, a clacker, one of these clackers. Uh, something happens to him and he becomes self-aware. So all the clackers are like slaves, right? This one wakes up. It's like a matrixy kind of thing. And uh, so he's being pursued by the Dutch because like they can't have what they call a rogue. Um, the, the French are weary of, of working, you know, being nice to him and all this stuff. It's, it's a phenomenal series of books, but, and this is where, this is, where, <laughs> bear with me here. <laughs> <laughs> the clackers are always described as making pings, clicks, tongs, oh, yeah. <laughs> clock like clock like sounds, and they communicate to each other like that. And you know, and their bodies are made of springs and all this shit. When I heard that track, man, I was like, holy shit, dude! This is like th this track sounds like how these beings are described in this book and i know this is like a deep cut and if you're not familiar with the book then you have no idea what i'm talking about but hopefully out there somebody will know what i'm saying but it it was a spot on rendition of what this author was describing in these books i've i've, I've been reading well you, you know, know? How for old films percussionists would do all the foley work live oh yeah if they ever make a film rendition of uh of this, you know, I could do uh, the live Foley for it or just the soundtrack, I guess. So, you know, they could hire there, me. Yeah, there you go. That's <laughs> yeah, that's really funny Um, that you bring that up because I know it's probably you could probably Google it. But it's like there's definitely a picture of like the Warner Brothers, like sound effect team from like the 20s or 30s or something. And like, you know, one dude's about to hit like a gong and another dude's at a xylophone and another oh, dude's the other got a, dude has a gun. And right? a guy and yeah, yeah the yeah, guy's yeah. got the track <laughs> and the guy's got talking. the track. 
right. And he's got the track pistol. And I was like, I was like, I guarantee that's an Elmer Fudd com- like cartoon, dude. Like that's yeah, gotta yeah. be what that is. You know, that's hilarious. No, and, I know and, the picture. Yeah. Yeah. In that, in that track, man, just like, you know, You're waiting it, for the gun to go off. Yeah. The track. Right, yeah right. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, I just, I, I just love the use of the, 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 the it, it was very, and another comparison is it reminded me of John Cage's imaginary landscape. No, um, Mm. I believe number one or number three, I believe both are percussion pieces that use, uh, you know, non musical instrument objects. And it it took me, it, it, it took me to that. It had that kind of sound to it. Very interesting stuff, man. Like, were you, um, you know, like, were you trying to aim for that or were you just trying to use like different tonal colors on, on different tracks and just exploring? Like, what, was there any process to that, to that recording? Um, yeah, well, that recording in particular, I did a series of pieces. So when I was recording the record, I had some compositions, quote unquote compositions, you know, things, uh, jumping off points, I guess you can call them. Sure. And then other times it was just pure improvisations and i did a number of them where they were sort of in that style where they were no no pulse slash implied pulse sound pieces you know and that's generally how i like to improvise uh with objects on the drum heads and things like that so that was just that was just one of the improvisations and the name clock so there's clock one and clock two the name clock came about by my friend um ap who was recording he was a recording engineer and he was like yeah man you should name that piece clock and i was like <laughs> and he was he was like yeah because that thing that you did with the bell on the drum head at the end it sounds like it sounds like a like an alarm going off or something or something like that like i forget yeah, what he grandfather said grandfather so, you know, or something yeah and you know i'm the type of person where um i don't generally title things or i have difficulty titling things so yeah, it would have just yeah. they all would have just been untitled so but, <laughs> yeah so i was i was like cool i'll name a clock you know because he needed something to save it as in sure. um in pro tools or logic or whatever he was using um you know and so i was just like oh yeah name a clock whatever and that just you know but um some of them did actually have names um and they were all one word names so clock worked so i was like clock worked clock work um so then it uh it worked out you know oh I, I i hear you man because my a lot of my tunes are the something oh it's really? like yeah I, I hate i hate naming tunes i there's a couple that i really think about and come to and feel semi secret secretively proud of myself because i think i'm so fucking smart because it's like oh <laughs> nobody else thought of this here we go you know brushing my hands oh, yeah. but, but a lot of times yeah it's like I think of a cool word and I put the in front of it and that's it because the clock. I, I'm gonna yeah, change the exactly. record. There now. you go. The, the clock, the waltz. The, yeah. There you go because <laughs> be, because it's like I I fucking hate it. It's hard enough to sometimes it's hard enough to fucking conceptualize your piece to begin with. It's like oh and now I got to spend more brain power naming this motherfucker. Like come on, you know. So yeah, you know. I mean, it's not all it's not all uh, easy peasy to some of us. Yeah, I just try to keep the names as like minimal and straightforward. You know, like the piece Waltz. It's a waltz. You know, I heard. It's like, I heard. I can I, confirm. You know, <laughs> yeah, and it's just like I just was like, what am I gonna name it? It's just waltz. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what it is. You know. Yeah. If I if I make another waltz, you know what I'll name it? I'll probably name it Waltz too. You know. Do it up, man. I fully support this. <laughs> fully support this stuff, man. Just but, easy, uh, you know. Yeah, but uh, seriously, so like uh, this is uh, this album is under 1039 Records Pool Improvised Music Series. Uh, are, are you connected to that at all, or is it just uh, your label? Oh, yeah, and, those and... are my friends. Oh, okay, my, yeah, those are my friends, Aaron and Kevin. Aaron okay. Rubenstein, who's a phenomenal guitarist, and yeah, Kevin okay, Murray, who is a um, a phenomenal drummer. He's my arch nemesis, you know. Yeah. <laughs> no, we... I, I, I'm only kidding, he's he's a very good friend, but we're always, you know joking around about that how we take each other's ideas and we're always trying to be influenced by each other he's he's the man though he's fantastic that's awesome i i i never had a friend like i never had a colleague like that especially on the trumpet because trumpet players fucking hate each other it sucks yeah. dude uh you know in college all of my friends were rhythm section players so it's like mm. man nobody understands you know what was yeah, i'm lucky to to be around when i was at the new school i was lucky to have been around so many great free jazz drummers then we would all we were all friends you know there was no 
There's no nothing. Except for me and Kevin. We hate each other. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I love you, Kevin. <laughs> um, you know, and um, yeah, so I was around Kevin Murray, uh, Rafa Tessin, uh, Caleb Cronin. There were a bunch, you know, and um, sure. you know, we all kind of uh, would make music together. You know, there were there were classrooms that had two drum sets. So, you know, we get together and do sessions where there were either two drummers in an ensemble or we'd play duo. I remember um, Patrick Granson. He was another friend of mine and we would play duo a lot together and, um, you know, just duo drum set. And that's that was really fun. It was great that they had that room with two drum sets. So that way we could, you know, we could mess around with that type of stuff. And we. Yeah, you know, that's a real treat. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's like, you know, drummers have like sheds where they have like, you know, the gospel chops, like shed session or something. And then like we and then the free drummers, you know, we have our like free jazz chop shed fest or whatever, you know, where we're trying to like see what each other are doing, you know. Yeah, it's cool, man. I I, I, I think that's just great, man. It, it it makes me like I know I said this before. It makes me yearn to like do get this stuff happening myself because it's like. I, I would do, you know, pre pandemic, I would do like one to two free jam performances a year. You know, I, I, I would do my, uh, my solo trumpet stuff and then maybe like a duo performance and, you know, it would be the most stressful two gigs of the year for me because it was like, I don't get to do this stuff often. So I'm really fucking focused on it. And I really want to like make, you know, sir X, Y, Z and you know, all this stuff happen. And, Oh, Despite, just don't care. Just don't oh, care about oh, it. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's sure, the sure. trick, you know? Yeah, just sure. Be like, just be like, you know, just, oh, we're going to go play. You know, we're going to yeah. have fun now. If they, if they if the audience doesn't have fun, they can go screw themselves, you know? <laughs> right. Of course. Yeah. Fuck them. Uh, did you ever, did you ever play Never Ending Books or any of the series oh, they had there? Oh, dude, don't remind me. Oh, okay. Oh, man. Yeah. RIP to the great Never Ending Books. It's like yeah. another casualty of the COVID pandemic, yeah, man. man. Uh, Such for, a cool fucking place, man. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone who doesn't know, it was a it was a ground floor storefront venue. It had the smallest stage I had ever seen in my life. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, the New Haven Improvisers Collective was based out of there, and uh, countless countless shows uh, put on by various musicians. Um, uh, Carl Testa had the uncertainty music series going for a few years. Uh, and I'm trying to think of some other stuff. Connor Peralt had like a noise thing. Oh yeah. There. Yeah. I'm and, good friends with Connor. We, yeah. Oh yeah. We cool stuff there. Cool. Yeah. He's a cool guy. Um, no, he's just, the man. you know, so much, it was like, that was like the, the free jam, uh, art rock, uh, free jazz venue, man. Like that, that was the one place where it was like, anything goes. I remember bringing my wife, I, we weren't married yet and we had maybe only been dating for like six months and I had a solo trumpet gig and I was on the bill. I think Connor put Connor put me on the bill and I, you know, this was like, you know, early in the relationship, she, she wanted to come to like every gig at that point. And I was like, well, this one's a bit different, but if you come, <laughs> I promise to take you out to a nice dinner or drinks afterwards, you know? And like, <laughs> you know, and she was a good sport about it. And she was like, that was really cool. You played a lot of weird sounds. And I was like, thank you. I love you. You know? <laughs> and it's just like nothing but good memories of that place. It's so sad. It's gone now. Yeah, man. That It's uh, yeah, it's a real, uh, shit i mean it's just yeah uh it's uh it is what it is i mean it you know we gotta move forward hopefully um hopefully by the time this bullshit is all over we'll uh still have places to play the music you know and um yeah i uh, i i believe yeah. so you know i I, I know that like some people don't want to hear positivity and I, and I totally understand. That. <laughs> so yeah, I remember just dwell in hell. Yeah. Well, you know, I, you know, I try to just keep things in perspective and it's like when I got out of school, man, the 2008 collapse happened. It happened the mm. summer I graduated, you know, there were no jobs. And if there was a job, uh, it, it, it paid 10 bucks. If you were lucky, um, you got, you know, you got like a pitcher of soda. If you played a bar gig, you know, you yeah. were lucky. And I remember everybody saying back then, Oh, shit's so dire. Like venues were closing and, and so on and so forth. But it, you know, it sprung back. And I think the only thing that's keeping everybody down is like, we can't do our thing. So once we can, I'm hoping there's this bounce back and, and everyone's mm. so, hungry for community and culture and art and music and stuff. I feel like 
there's going to be a big push for things to happen. Whether you get paid <laughs> doing it, I think that might be a little delayed, but at least there will be opportunities, you know? Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, you can, you can look forward to the more important part of making music uh, soon. I think I, I'm, I'm trying to remain hopeful about that. Mm, definitely. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. Uh, but uh, then talk about uh, real quick this this other record. Um, uh, oh no no no! You, you you did talk about. I wanted to ask you about the pool improvised music series. So Aaron and Kevin also run that. Where where's that base out of? Uh, it's based out of Brooklyn. You should get them on the podcast, both of them. To oh, do, I would love uh, to. I'm not trying to tell you what to do, but I'm I'm just saying they're 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 the the two guys that I think right now you should talk to because they're up and coming and they're really doing some really incredible things and I. I, I just want to shout them out, you know, because yeah, definitely, good friends, definitely. So. Yeah. I, um, you know, the jazz underground is going to be two, uh, in, in February. So oh, it's wow. like, yeah. So man, we were, we were cut at the knees right when we got the ball rolling, you know, like mm. right when things were feeling like an oiled machine is when the fucking pandemic hit. So, yeah, so same thing I, with you know, me, cause I had the Willamantic series. Yeah. And, uh, oh, dude. records. And so I, that was that was kind of a bummer. I forgot but about that. Hopefully, it'll you know something will come of it when yeah. we get out of it. But um, yeah, yeah. The will uh, the Willamantic thing. How did that start? I I man I. Oh, uh, you know, this is the man. most, <laughs> most um, cliche thing, but it's like, man, I wanted to go so many times, but it was just like, I, I, well, they were late. like Saturday, Saturday <laughs> afternoons or something, right? Yeah, no, we did. Um, yeah. Was it Saturday or Sunday. Oh, that's depressing. Remember. I don't even remember now. Oh yeah, God. Well, yeah. <laughs> but I always, I was always like, God damn it. I got, you know, and I think I said to you once, I was like, keep inviting me to this shit because the second I can get out to Willimantic, I'm going to, you know, mm. it's like. You know, it's I, a trek. I, want, I don't blame yeah. you. You know, it's, it, it could be a trek. Yeah. Um, and I think, was it, did it ever compete with Joe's series at the State House? Because I was like, oh, thank God. At no, least it's down no. The street. no, no, no. Just time yeah, frame, yeah, time, yeah. time frame wise. Um, that's, so it must well, have been Saturday. I tried not to have them on the. Yeah, I think so. I, I don't yeah. think it was ever. A, I mean, Joe had me play on his um, the multiplex series. So I, don't, I don't think yeah. there was any harsh vibes. And Joe played. The Willamantic series like three times. I think I think it was just good all around because you know we both wanted places to do stuff. You know. Yeah. No. 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 I don't mean competitive in like trying to steal the show. I mean competitive in uh, were they ever like at the same time? But they must not have been because I, I don't think they remember. were. I don't think they Maybe, were. I think. Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, I don't remember. Honestly, man, it's, it was so long ago. And you it feels asked like me earlier about um, how it started i don't even remember i remember that i was playing at willimantic records on occasion okay. with um a band i'm in foxtails and so we played there a few times in their very old space and then i think i just hit i hit joe up you know yeah. and um who runs this not joe morris but joe who runs oh, willimantic oh, okay. records yeah and gotcha. um and Joe Malinowski, I think his name is, if I'm correct. I, okay. I forget his last name. But um, and I was just like, hey man, I I do this like free jazz stuff. Would you be interested in having me? Because I I knew that he was kind of into it because he had a bunch of like Paul Flaherty records, you know, because he's around there, and so he had a bunch of Flaherty records for sale. And so I was like, oh, so he's probably into free jazz and stuff. And so he was more than down to do it. And so I kept, you know, looking at his space, and he was kind enough to let me do it and um that's awesome yeah it was sick it was a cool relationship and it, it still is i mean there's no obviously nothing you know we just everything's just on hold right now and, yeah the um, great hopefully, pause hopefully something comes comes back you know out of it but sure oh God, yeah I, I, I joe right i haven't spoken <laughs> I, I i don't speak to i'm so oh man i hope i don't get blood i'm pretty sure his name is joe yeah yeah, his name is Joe. Okay. I'm like doubting myself. I'm like 99% positive it's Joe. But... <laughs> well, you might be in the witness protection after uh, after this yeah, interview. I, know, I, 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 I don't, you know. People I, are going to be out there. With yeah. In my head, no. What, if you're um, out there listening, shout out to you for how the <laughs> series. You're the man. I really appreciate it. Sure. Love you. That's all you can do, dude. We're all going through gross traumatic experiences and yeah. we're not talking about it but anyway i digress uh you're also a, a visual artist man like I've, I've seen you post your artwork online like uh is, yeah man. you know talk about that what's what's that about uh i like painting uh abstract art it's like colorist kind of art like yeah color yeah. field stuff and yes. um that type of stuff and uh i got into it 
because when I was in high school, I got into abstract art and uh, I remember taking painting classes and we had to paint landscapes and I didn't really enjoy doing that that much, sure. you know? And so like, I just decided one day I wanted to do my own. So I went to the art store, bought some canvases and paint and made some really awful paintings. And um, now I think, you know, like eight years later or so, I think I've actually honed my style, I guess. And I'm starting to like deeper, get, get deeper into my own style, you know? So yeah, that's good. No, that's, that's cool, man. I, 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 I think it's fucking cool that like you got into this shit in high school, man. Most people, you know, even, even like artistic quote unquote people, I think uh, yeah. don't get into it that, that early. That's, that's not awesome. To be pretentious, that you started. No, not I'm, at all. I'm like the, like, I guess the black sheep of like high school. Is that the right term? You know? Yeah. 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 I, I know what you're saying. There I was, was a, definitely the weirdo, I guess. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> fine, man. They're far more interesting than, than, you know, the, the <laughs> people that grow up to be like everybody else. Believe me, it's, it's, yeah. It's going to their high better. school reunion, yeah, and, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you I, know, I got I got a job in finance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I believe me, man. Because people, it, it, funny enough, is like I've I've been to a couple of my high school reunions, and the first thing everyone says is, is uh, uh, yeah, you're it's so cool. You play music. It's so great that you're a musician. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, motherfuckers. Uh, I also like wasn't even in the top three for most musical. In fact, all those people aren't even musicians anymore. So yeah. let's talk about that travesty. So <laughs> believe me, there's plenty more ways you could, you could uh, negatively uh, uh, direct that energy. I could give yeah. you, I can give you the lessons on that. <laughs> I, I'm kidding. I don't care, but it's like, it's fun to bring up. Um, no, yeah. no, 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 that's, that's really cool, man. I, you know, I think that. It was funny because before this interview, uh, not to interrupt you. No, go ahead. Um, but I actually just stopped at the art store and I got um, I got two new tubes of acrylic paint, two colors that I haven't previously owned. Oh, so okay. I'm excited to use those. I want to see how they blend, what they do. I got some canvases as well. So it's funny that you bring that up. Oh, nice. Nice. Well, I look forward to seeing the end product. Uh, what um, I was going to say, like, I think it's really great when musicians have other interests you know, I try, you know, being, you know, I've been doing this long enough now where I'm like starting to become one of the older guys. Right. And I'm always telling younger cats, I'm like, yo, you got to like get into other shit, man. Like you can't, you can't yeah. just only yeah. be listening to Charlie Parker. You got to experience, <laughs> you got to experience life. There's got to be other things to do. And so I'm always super excited when I find out a musician has like another interest or hobby or side hustle or something. And I don't care if you're quote unquote bad at it. It's just good that you do it. Yeah. You know, so many of our heroes did other shit. Like the most yeah. obvious example for me is like Miles Davis. Painted, yeah, he painted. and he boxed yep. you know he, he, he boxed, was a, yeah yeah and it's like you gotta do this stuff man it and it, it keeps things fresh too, yes you know? yeah so it's yeah like, exactly it inspire you get the inspiration from these other things you know it's um, all it all feeds back into it it's just this ball of energy that just keeps it's like the sun you know it's just yeah. nuclear what is it called nuclear fusion or whatever fusion i think the sun is fusion, fusion or, yeah fusion or fusion something or, you know, yeah. just keeps creating energy or fission you know? it might be fission fission, fission. Might, yeah, yeah fission. i was gonna say fission but yeah 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 I think, yeah, I think so. <laughs> but um, <laughs> we're going to get blasted uh, by the scientists. I know, now, man. Know. We got the oh, scientists. Yeah, we right. got, oh, yeah, oh, we, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we've got the scientists. We've got your own friends and family. Like everybody's just coming after us now. I'm trying um, to think who we have left. <laughs> <laughs> just you and me, man. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Thelma, Thelma and Louise style. Um, yeah. So, so, uh, you got this, uh, this solo records coming out in January, uh, any other projects uh, on the horizon yet? Or are you still like, are you just like kind of, uh, taking it one step at a time, uh, for the time being? Um, well, I'm making art and I sell it. I post it on Facebook and, uh, I've been selling it, which is cool. Occasionally, uh, sure. sometimes it doesn't sell, uh, I, I've been practicing, of course, and working on uh, practicing. And the practicing is getting deep now. You know, practicing before was like, all right, let's work on some stuff. And now it's like, you know, since I've spent so much time with myself, now it's like my practicing is a lot deeper and how I, how I want to accomplish things within a practice period, you know. Uh, I've been doing that. I've been eating a lot of fast food because uh, 
That's what I do. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> let me, let me, uh, I sample you know. all the delicacies of the yeah, grease exactly. of the grease yeah. spoon. Yeah. And um, what else I've been up to? Uh, I work at a grocery store, which uh, it is what it is. It's cool, it's not, man. Uh, you know, it is what I, it is. I say this ad nauseum. <laughs> Kenny Dorham was a mailman. There's no gig beneath oh, us. Oh, yeah. You know, you got to do what you got to do. Uh, Mark Edwards, who's a really fantastic drummer. He's the drummer on Dark to Themselves by Cecil Taylor. I was talking to him at a show one time, and he was telling me how he met Cecil Taylor. I think Mark told me he was working as a bank teller. And so that was... Uh, that I, was think like, I, knew, I think yeah. I knew he did that, yeah. Well, you know, a lot no, of people don't... Uh, a lot of people don't know that after... McCoy Tyner left Coltrane's band. He drove a cab for like five years. Really? I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah. Well, you know, he left the band and Alice Coltrane uh, replaced him. That was like 66. You know, it was like the last two years of Coltrane's life. Um, okay, McCoy, okay. Yeah. Mc McCoy slamming was on the brakes like he's slamming that. that yeah. Right. The fifth on the, yeah, it's like... And I, I can't remember. It might have been Josh Bruno who told me. Um, that one time Curtis Fuller got into a cab with his wife and it was McCoy driving Damn. something, something, or maybe like Steve Teray told that story. I feel like it, either Josh Bruno or Steve Teray mentioned that story. And it's just like, Oh God. But like, you know, you gotta do what you gotta do, man. Like I, I just appreciate that they did that. Like, like I appreciate that you work at a grocery store and still pursue your art versus giving up the art and going and working at like a hedge fund. You know well, what I mean? I'm thinking about giving up the art for the grocery thing because the grocery thing, it's just honestly, I think that passion is outweighing the music and the painting at this point. I mean, I love <laughs> scanning groceries and it's just sure. you know, very handling zen. them. Yeah, very, no, I, no, I hate it. Um, shout out to Mark Edwards, by the way. Big shout Word. out to Mark Edwards. Word. Yeah. You know, Good when I was man. in college, man, I worked at a pawn shop. So while I was, while I was Pawn taking my, th yeah, well, yeah, my boss looked just like that guy while oh, I, I, so I was, I was taking like music theory by day and, uh, uh, on the weekends I was working at this, like, you know, just like Pawn Stars, but with like all the debauchery that comes with it, uh, Pawn Shop. And to be honest with you, that job sucked ass, but why, but the reason why I kept it for like four years is because I was in a touring band in my mm. boss would let me take, uh, you know, two, three months off at a time to go oh, tour, damn. you know, to go tour and then come back. So like, you know, I, I, I don't know why he, he was so nice to me, but, but he was, you know, and, so, yeah, and, whatever kid, go play. Yeah. Your, your no, he used, music. <laughs> he used, you know, he used to be like, yeah, whatever, you know, like, you know, cause I don't know why I don't, I, I honestly don't know why he kept getting, maybe he, he always wanted to be a jazz trumpet player. Maybe he saw something in you. He's like, yeah, go, go chase your dreams, kid. You know? He, no, nah, he always called me college boy. So oh, I, I think there, yeah, it might've been something else, but <laughs> College boy. Yeah, it was well. You know what's funny? I got the I got the job because my the the pawn shop was in Waterbury, Connecticut, and my father was a Waterbury cop for like twenty five years, and my dad knew him, so I think like my first Nintendo came from this shop, you know. So oh, okay. I think yeah, I think yeah. I think he hired me because he like owed my dad. He owed my dad something, you know. Like probably got my he my dad probably got him out of some bad news back in the day and so uh, yeah. he was fulfilling <laughs> uh uh you know uh, uh a promise so but i was able to pursue my art and, and work in this shit job man and you know uh so like i was saying it's better to to find that gig that lets you pay the bills so that you can, you know, pursue yeah. Your so, music. I mean, so I'm nine, you know, in I, the back, I'm a teacher um, and it's like pretty impressed with myself. I'm so I grateful so that because uh, I enjoy two teaching. episodes because <laughs> it's a hard job. <laughs> um, it's it's like, the little things. I, I'm glad that we like, always got to keep so that the I bar can low so it feels stuff. like we're super you know, productive. And not have to worry Especially when we're putting out a one man show, such as a podcast. But no, in all seriousness, I'm so glad Eric can drop by and, you know, keep at it, man. I really have. I think that, you're doing uh, some you know, cool shit. Could, uh, I have a it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And, uh, I, I know I'm we'll, always we'll like I'm always like sending enough. you tracks of um, shit I like. Yeah, and, what else is going on? No, always, don't forget you're always very polite. Um, um, partnership good. with I, I the NHJU yeah, has yeah. Buskers going uh, on Chicago this Underground. So if you're downtown, oh, yeah, so you have time to go downtown, check out some musicians. Yeah, you know why, man? Because Christmas tunes and I know standards and so cheesy, but all kinds of stuff. That happens. I never had four Saturday and Sunday featuring. 
hearing like various jazz. horn players. I never did. I never did. When, when, I, when I got out of school, and, uh, I yeah, was trying to. I think that will do it for like today. Involving myself so in like the straight until next time. Jazz scene. This has been Mr. Millennial's Revenge. Time. Like I'm your host, Nick DiMaria. This is a production scene. of the and New I Haven Jazz like Underground. The, the, Thank you so much for listening. And uh, please be safe. Please, please, the, please like, bebop take COVID it crazy. seriously yeah, it as well, I cannot I guess stress they kinda, enough they're, they're and over and over again. Ways. Uh, the we're in this together, thing, literally, well, ahead, and I, like, I had to learn the hard way, I guess. So anyway, happy December, and see you at the next episode. All right. Thanks so much. Take care. You should try on the Blitz 7 chord. And then you're like, okay, yeah, fuck you, man. And then the free jazz thing, people are vibey because they create these like clicks of people, like these sure. tight, tight knit groups of people that they only like play with each other. They only like, they only, they all like have the same conceptions musically, which is fine. That's great. That's a great way of like building like a sound in a small community. But like, there's all these clicks, and then they all hate each other. It's like uh, these this group of people. Uh, they play like this. They play too many notes, or they play too little notes, or they play too loud, or they play too quiet, or they do this, or they do that. So we don't like them. Oh, this group does this. They do that. They do that. So we don't like them. And then you'll have these gigs where two people are on the bill doing a solo set, and you know one of them is number two, and one of them is number four, or whatever in the in the lineup, and they're standing outside for each other's sets, like smoking because they don't want to. They don't even want to support each other, right. or they're they're doing stuff where like you know, they won't play with each other or, or you try to book somebody for a gig and then they'll be, they'll be like, Oh, who's on the bill. And then you'll say, Oh, blah, blah, blah. And so-and-so. And they'll go, Oh, so-and-so. I don't, I hate that guy. Fuck that guy. <laughs> yeah. I'm not fucking fuck you. If you think I'm going to play, you know? And I mean, this has happened very far few and in between, but there are certain, you know, and I guess people have their reasons. I'm not trying to say that you can't, like dis strongly dislike somebody so much that you don't want to associate yourself musically with them. But sometimes I feel like people take it really, really far. There's sometimes where I understand completely, but then there's sure. sometimes where I'm like, come on, man, just like, just like being like civil with each other. Right. Like just you don't like, have to talk you know, to the guy. Yeah. Like just be fucking civil, man. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I, I joke that I don't know what's worse. Uh, when you, when you, you know, I, I, I Hey Mike, I got, I got a gig on Friday. Uh, can you make it? I, I don't know what's worse. Uh, the response is, uh, how much does it pay or who else is on the gig? Like if those are the first, if those are, if one of those are the first responses, I'm always like, Oh, I wish I didn't call you, but well, you got to know the people. Like, you know, you gotta know if somebody's like, Oh, there's this guy he's like he likes making music because he loves making music and he has money to support himself already from like a day job or something will he do this or to add like how will he respond i've had people do that to me where they were like you know like oh we're gonna need like this much guarantee if you want me to play and it's funny because i've had that from people who are like who are like important in their own like smaller scenes but then i've had people like um like Daniel Carter, you know, play at the Willimantic series. And Daniel was like just down to earth, just down to play. Yeah. You know, and he just he just came and he was like, Yeah, man, I just want to play. You yeah. know? Yep. And then um I had uh oh God, I'm forgetting his name. Uh Ben Monder, I think. Yeah, I had Ben okay. Monder. And um he was super down to earth and chill. He was like, Yeah, you know, they just wanted to play. Was it Ben Monder? Oh, I'm forgetting, man. I'm forgetting his name. But I, I had some people play where it's like, you know, they really cared about like, yeah, like I love this music, but like I need that guarantee. That way I could like pay for gas. And I get that. Like that's. Totally oh, yeah, cool. I get that, too. You know? I'm, ta I'm talking yeah. about like they, you know, they're they're worry about who could be in the band because, you know, it, they might be beneath them or something. Oh, really? Oh, man. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't I don't know many people that are like that in like the free music thing. I feel mm -hmm. like that's more of like a. Like maybe a straight ahead thing where people are like, oh, well, that guy sucks, blah, 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 blah you know. Yeah. But in the free music thing, it's like, yeah, let's see what happens. I haven't played with this guy yet. Or, you know, oh, oh yeah, you know. Well, when we get back to normal, I'm going to just pop up to every fucking free thing I can come to and just be like, because I am, I'm going to be like, hey, man, two thumbs up, finger guns. I'm down to play, guys. And just go from there. No, yeah. Yeah, let's <laughs> play, man. Um, Mike, it's been awesome talking to you thank you so much for being on the show um 
and uh, talking about music and, and, and your art and all that stuff. I really appreciate yeah. it. And so, you're uh, gonna, so the, you're still going to give me like the 150 for the interview, right? Yeah. Yeah. Dude, wait for me to hit the okay. record off. Button. Oh, dude, come I'm, on, sorry. Come on. Yeah, yeah, come I'm, I'm sorry. Now I got to edit right this now. whole thing. Great. No, man. We'll do it over. <laughs> Start it <laughs> again. I need a guarantee for this podcast. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, need, God. I need it for the, the internet bill. You know? I can't I wait. I can't, money. <laughs> I can't wait for the first person to say that to me. I cannot because yeah. there's going to be somebody. <laughs> you're going to have to. You're not going to contact them. You're going to contact their their representative. Right. Like, right. Mr. Mr. LaRocca is going to need eight thousand dollars. to Right. Do this. And a whole yeah, sandwich yeah, yeah, platter. Yeah. Sandwich oh, yeah, platter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Delivered to his house yeah. for the Zoom meeting. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. exactly uh no i'm sorry i ruined the conclusion no 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 it was actually (laughs) i had to make that joke no it was perfect i I appreciate it but seriously michael roca thank you so much for being on the podcast uh i I hope we can have you back on soon and uh good luck on the uh album release and all your all your pursuits and uh you know man like let's play when all this stuff is uh back to normal and keep doing what you're doing and, and and keep letting the world know because it's great that uh uh, you know, your, your run, show running and stuff. That's just as important. So really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you to anyone who listens to this and wants to listen to me BS my way through being able to talk about my own art. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, sure. uh, you know, so thank you for having me, Nick. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, you're found. I, I forgot to ask. You're found on, uh, you know, we can find you on Facebook. Uh, yep. Band Band Camp Camp. Michael LaRocca. Uh, There's some YouTube videos. If you look at Michael LaRocca drums or whatever, he'll find, you know. Awesome. Awesome. I'm sure people will check you out. So, all right, man, uh, till next time, I will see you there. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I hope you guys dug that one. Uh, Mike's a cool guy, and I uh, had a lot of fun talking to him. And uh, best of luck on those releases, and I hope to see, uh, you know, and I'm sure I will see a lot more from him in the in the coming months as things kind of get back to normal here. You know, fucking COVID, am I right? We're, um, as teachers, we're, uh, speaking of COVID, we're uh, supposed to start getting vaccinated uh, February 1st. So we'll see about that. (laughs) You know, uh, I just, you know, talking about, uh, soul before, and I know I said it then. And I, and I said the last episode, man, I just miss, I miss my gig, man. I miss, I miss my job. I miss making music with kids because it is fun. And it definitely, absolutely. Like I said, it, 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 if you're a musician and you want to teach music to kids during the day, man, it is fulfilling. And it is balancing, and I am very grateful for the opportunity to do so. I think there's too much of a stress on college level stuff, you know? And uh, yeah, that's cool. And I would love to teach like a college level combo someday. But hey, man, teacher recorder ain't so bad, you know? It really isn't. And I never thought I'd miss it. But uh, after all this time, you know, we're, we're on what, 10 months now uh, since being uh, in school, and I realized that. Those were things that I really appreciated. So, you know, it's something to think about. You know, but enough <laughs> enough of all that mushy nonsense stuff. Seriously, uh, check out those movies I was talking about. So, you know, obviously Souls one, but that Ska one, even if you're not even into Ska, it was really enjoyable because I bet you'll recognize a lot of the music uh, that was portrayed in the film. So, uh, yeah, I think that will uh, just about do it for us today. So, um... Thanks for tuning in. This has been Mr. Millennial's Revenge. I'm your host, Nick DiMaria. This is a production of the New Haven Jazz Underground. And yeah, I'll see you at the next episode. Thanks so much. Take care.